Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where in the world you are tuning in. I'm Max Hegbaum, Editor-in-Chief of FEMS Microbiology Ecology, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to this webinar on the ecology of soil microorganisms. Our speakers today span the globe from Europe to North America to New Zealand, and looking at who's logged in, we also have a global audience. So thank you for joining us today. FEMS continues the series of webinars to support the microbial community. As a not-for-profit organization, FEMS, the Federation of European Microbiological Societies, uses the income from our journals to fund our charitable activities and support our community. FEMS journals indeed invest in science. We provide grants to scientists, organize and support conferences, and sponsor a range of events such as this webinar series. These webinars provide a forum for the presentation and discussion of key research, enabling the flow of ideas despite the cancellation of in-person events and conferences right now. Each month, we are highlighting a different topic of microbial ecology. And so if you missed our earlier webinars, they are also available via the FEMS and Oxford University Press websites. Today, we focus on the fascinating topic on the ecology of soil microorganisms. Indeed, soil is alive with diverse microbial communities, bacteria, fungi, archaea, protozoa, and viruses, with complex interactions and ecological networks. Soil microorganisms are the driving force of biogeochemical cycling and a bridge that links above and below ground ecosystem interactions and key ecosystem processes. Today we have presentations by Michael Van Newland, Amanda Black, and Fleming Ekeland, who explore three different soil habitats, a temperate boreal forest ecotone, old growth cowrie forest in New Zealand, and agricultural and forest soils. And they examine the effects of climate change, loss of indigenous three species, and the effects of soil amendments. After the three talks, we will open the session for questions and discussion. And you can submit your questions via the question link in, in the GoToWebinar uh, platform. So, Again, our three speakers, Michael Van Newland, Amanda Black, and Fleming Ekeland. Our first speaker, Michael, is a postdoctoral scholar in the Department of Biology at Stanford University, and he will discuss warming and disturbance, how it alters soil microbiome diversity and function in a northern forest ecotone. Michael, the floor is yours. Thank you, Max. Let me share my screen here. Okay. Yeah, so thanks everybody for virtually tuning in. Um, my name is Michael Van Newland. I'm a postdoc in the biology department at Stanford University. And uh, today I am, let me close. Oop, I don't want to do that. Hang on one second. Okay, I'm trying to close that. Okay, great. Um, Today, I'm excited to share some of my work um, on how the soil microbiome responds to environmental change in forest ecosystems. And I'm excited about this work because um, it helps us understand a little bit more about the importance of interconnectivity of microbial communities and determining community responses, as well as thinking about how structure and function are linked when microbial communities respond to environmental change. And I wanna quickly acknowledge my co-authors on this work that are spread across the US. Um, and the Department of Energy for funding uh, for the experiment that I'll be talking about. So soil microbes are incredibly important regulators of forest health and ecosystem function. And that's because they do important things related to biology or chemistry cycle below ground, as Max was mentioning. Um, mycorrhizal fungi, for example, form really extensive symbioses with plant root systems that protect them from herbivores and also help plants access essential resources and nutrients from their environment. Free living fungi and bacteria also help mine uh, minerals and nutrients from the environment. And of course, these activities have important consequences for the global carbon cycle. Their activities, uh, they respire CO2 into the atmosphere, but they also help stabilize carbon below ground through the decomposition and turnover of 
complex organic molecules. And so if we want to understand how soil microbes respond to environmental change like uh, climatic warming, an important, important areas to look are spots with lots of soil carbon. And here it's important to point out that soil carbon is not evenly distributed across the world, that there is a lot more of it in high latitude forest systems. The map on the left shows how the density of soil organic carbon increases at, uh, in these high latitude forest systems in the blue and green areas. And the right figure shows how the total soil carbon stock increases with latitude as well. In North America, these high latitude forest systems are dominated by boreal tree species. So this is the dark green area stretching across Canada and parts of the US. These boreal forests are typically made up of spruce and fir tree species, for instance. But interestingly, there's this important ecotone or transitional ecosystem between temperate forests, that's more southern latitudes, that are made up of oaks and maple tree species, for instance, where they coexist with the southern range limit of boreal forest tree species in this sort of lighter green band um, stretching across North America. And this transitional ecosystem is really uh, an interesting and important area to look at environmental change because the tree species are responding differently. Temperate tree species have been shown to typically respond positively to warming because they're at their colder northern range limit. Whereas boreal tree species have shown to respond negatively to warming because they're at their warmer southern range limit. So this ecotone is, represents a really important and interesting place to look at soil microbial responses to global change factors because you could imagine they're responding in multiple ways, right? They could respond directly by changes in uh, environmental pressures like warming or disturbance. They could be responding indirectly based on differences in tree species performance as the trees themselves are responding to change, um, or it could be some combination of the two. And so to look at this a little bit further, uh, I took advantage of an existing experiment that sits right in the middle of this ecotone in, in northern Minnesota in the United States called B4 Warmed, or the Boreal Forest Warming at an Ecotone in Danger Experiment, set up by researchers um, and co-authors on this paper at the University of Minnesota. This experiment consists of above and below ground warming in a realistic forest plot. So you can see the photos above. These are warming environments outside in natural forest environments. Um, and the warming experiment was set up in two different canopy disturbance treatments, closed canopies and open canopies, which represent important disturbance events in these forest systems that are important for the regeneration of certain tree species. So zooming into one of these plots, for instance, um, you can see in the bottom left photo is a, a zoomed in photo of what these plots look like. They have both above and below ground warming, like I mentioned, below ground warming from resistance heating cables and above ground warming with these infrared lamps to create three different levels of warming ambient where the entire setup was generated and the uh, switch just wasn't flipped on about a two degree Celsius and about a three and a half degree Celsius increase in temperature. And like I mentioned, under two disturbance or closed versus open canopy treatments. So we sampled 36 plots, six replicates of the three warming and two canopy treatment design. And each of these plots had 121 seedlings planted in it that represent five boreal, five temperate, and one non-native tree species in the system. We sampled five soil cores from these plots that were pooled at the plot level and extracted DNA we performed our microbial sequencing on a MySeq platform using 16S and ITS2 amplicons. And then I processed the data using the DATA2 bioinformatic pipeline, which generates amplicon sequence variants or ASVs. This resulted in a little over 3,000 bacterial ASVs. And I used the fungal database for the um, fungal side with the ITS amplicons to pull out ectomycorrhizal fungi versus saprotrophs. And ecto, ectomycorrhizal fungi, uh, just to jog your memory, are the type, one type of mycorrhizal symbiosis with plant roots that sort of form exterior structures and kind of squeeze their way in between plant cell roots. And saprotrophs here represent more of the free living decomposers. Now in the paper, I talked about all three of these um, groups. In this talk, I'm only gonna focus on the two fungal groups. One of the reasons is because there's a really strong link between the activity of ectomycorrhizae and saprotrophs in forest systems and their extracellular enzyme capabilities to decompose and degrade um, lignified or highly uh, cellulitic plant material. And we we uh, performed a soil enzyme assay from these soil cores um, as well to, to measure some level of community uh, function functional potential. <clears throat> 
So using this data, I'm going to be talking about three main research questions today. First, how did the different fungal groups that I mentioned respond to the warming and disturbance treatment? So kind of a classic microbial ecology test. The second, does connectivity predict the amount of fungal community change? And I'll talk a little bit more about what I mean by connectivity in a second. And third, are fungal community changes related to shifts in soil enzyme activity? So is structure related to function here? So jumping into this first question, and again, focusing on these two fungal groups, looking at Shannon diversity, first of all, across different warming treatments, we found not really a strong response. As you can see, all the, all the colors and open versus closed points are kind of clustered together. So the, the, we didn't find a strong overall diversity response. We did find a pretty strong compositional shift. So this is a principal component analysis where points closer together represent samples with more similar community composition of, of ectomycorrhizae in this case. Um, there were strong effects of warming and canopy disturbance on both community composition um, of ectomycorrhizae. And when we look at how relative abundance of different uh, ectomycorrhizal phyla change, we find a pretty strong decline in basidiomycota, which include ectomycorrhizal genera like Clavulina, Cortinarius, Lactarius, and Tomentella, and Ascomycota uh, slightly increased with the canopy disturbance. So we see these sort of different um, phyla level responses to the two different treatments, and there were no interactive effects uh, at the phyla level here. So showing the same types of plots for saprotrophic fungi, here we do see a slight bump in Shannon diversity with um, closed versus open canopies. So they seem to increase their diversity slightly from canopy disturbance. Relatedly, we see a stronger compositional shift of saprotrophic fungi with the canopy disturbance versus the warming treatment. So you can see the open kind of convex holes shift a little bit more to the right in the principal component analysis graph. And at the phyla level, we don't see any strong response at at the basidiomycota or ascomycota level, so suggesting that their community responses are happening at a finer taxonomic resolution. One other thing we looked at was the ratio of ectomycorrhizae to saprotroph uh, relative abundance in this system, showing that this ratio de actually declines with warming. So it's suggesting that the balance between root symbioses to free living decomposers in the system re is responding to these warming treatments in ways that could have uh, implications for carbon cycling. And we think this, this type of ratio shift is happening because past work has shown that boreal tree species that might be more reliant on ectomycorrhizal fungi are responding negatively to warming. So perhaps the, the ectomycorrhizae aren't uh, performing as well as their tree symbiotic partner is also performing more negatively. Okay, so moving on to this second question, how does connectivity predict the amount of uh, fungal community change? I was interested in this question because, I, so I showed the principal component analysis graphs and I think a lot of microbial ecologists uh, sort of do the standard community composition analyses. And I really wanted to kind of figure out what the next step would be and to figure out whether we could predict how much communities change. And one framework we can think about um, in terms of predicting community change is this disturbance framework, where if you have some, some level of community composition on the y-axis, some measure of community composition, and you have time on the x-axis, for instance, and some disturbance event like warming occurs at some point in time, and you measure the composition of the community um, before the disturbance at y1, and then you measure it later on at y2, that difference in community composition reflects how resistant the community is to changing pre versus post that disturbance. So I was interested in using this framework um, in combination with a relatively new method that was developed called cohesion, which is a way to, to quantify connectivity of taxa within uh, microbial communities. Now, I don't have a ton of time to go into this method in detail, but basically it's based on pairwise correlation, so similar to network-based approaches, but instead of creating a network, what you get on a per sample basis is a measure of how prevalent and abundant highly connected taxa are within your community. And again, it's at a per sample level, so you can start to apply it to this framework of how resistant are communities to change. And that's exactly what I was interested in doing, wondering whether if you start with a community that is less connected, so has less abundant, highly connected taxa in it, are those communities less resistant to change than communities that start out with greater levels of connectivity? So the plots on the right show what this framework would look like given how connectivity might relate to community resistance. <clears throat> so I was interested in doing this 
in this experiment, but we don't have a time series, although there is this implicit assumption of temporal patterns, basically because ambient treatments, ambient warming treatments reflect sort of current conditions, and the warmed treatments reflect pre predicted future scenarios. So there is a little bit of this before and after temporal component in the design, similar to the canopy to treatments as well. So Y1 versus Y2 are going to be ambient versus warm treatments or closed versus open canopy treatments. And I measured community change between these two treatments using Bray-Curtis dissimilarity, so low amounts of community change versus high amounts of community change as you move upwards on the y-axis. And I was interested in relating this to how much connectivity um, was in the community at starting level. So how much connectivity was in the community under ambient treatments in this case? If we find a negative relationship, this would suggest that connectivity helps promote resistance to change and that more connected communities are more similar between ambient versus warmed treatments, suggesting that they're more resistant to experiencing compositional shifts. Oppositely, if higher, if more connected communities are less similar between the two treatment types, this would suggest that connectivity actually enhances destabilization. So as one domino falls, so do lots of other dominoes within the community, so to speak. So here I was, um, are what the results are going to look like. Community connectivity, again, under the pre or control levels on the x-axis here, these are ambient tr temperature treatment samples. On the y-axis is the break curtis dissimilarity between ambient versus warmed communities for ectomycorrhizae and saprotrophic fungi. In both cases, we see a negative relationship, although for ectomycorrhizal fungi, there's a slight interaction between closed versus open canopy, but the overall trend is also a negative relationship. So communities that start with greater levels of connectivity in ambient treatments show less dissimilarity or more compositional similarity between ambient versus warm treatments. So again, suggesting that connectivity helps promote resistance to change. So that's the response to warming treatments. When we look at the response to disturbance, so closed versus open canopies, we find the same negative relationship or ne negative trend. So in both cases, there's evidence that starting levels of community connectivity help promote community resistance to change so that we can actually start to predict how much communities might change given warming or disturbance levels if we know how much connectivity is in the community to start with. Now, finally, I was interested in trying to relate how community shifts relate to these functional consequences, right? Because the activity of microorganisms below ground have important consequences for soil carbon cycling. So one thing, one of the first things we did was look at how enzyme profiles shift in a similar analysis type as looking at microbial community composition. So this is a principal component analysis of, um, of the suite of enzyme activities that we measured. So similar to the microbial composition. And here we see a stronger enzyme profile shift with canopy disturbance than with warming. So you can see the open convex holes kind of slightly move to the right in this graph. But again, I was interested in how these shifts in sort of cumulative enzyme function relate to the patterns of community responses to warming and disturbance. So one framework we can use to explore this is looking at differences in community composition between the two treatment types on the x-axis versus the difference in enzyme activity profiles on the y-axis. So basically relating the break curtis of microbial communities to the break curtis of enzyme activities. If there's a positive relationship, this would suggest there's some functional contingency in the community. So as commu with greater community changes comes greater functional changes, suggesting that certain members in the community do separate and unique functional activities contributing to enzyme profiles. Oppositely, if there's a negative relationship with greater community change, the system tends to remain the same or there's some redundancy in the community. So suggests that more functional redundancy or, or homeostasis is what we called it. So here's what the, these results are gonna look like. There's a difference in community composition that break curtis relationship on the x-axis and the difference in enzyme profile, similar break curtis measurements on the y-axis for just looking at how communities and enzyme profiles respond to warming treatments first. Here we see a slightly more complicated pattern for ectomycorrhizal fungi on the left, 
Under closed canopies in the solid line and closed points, there's this positive relationship. So this is consistent with functional contingency, basically that as ectomycorrhizal fungal communities change, so too does enzyme overall enzyme activity uh, characteristics. However, under open canopies, there's a negative relationship, so suggesting more of this functional redundancy or homeostasis with, with ectomycorrhizal community changes. With saprotrophic fungi, we see uh, under both canopy types this negative relationship, so indi in more indicative of that functional redundancy or a tendency of the system to remain the same as saprotrophic uh, communities change. When we look at the response to disturbance, Again, we see a positive relationship with ectomycorrhizal fungi, so more community change leads to more different enzyme activity profiles and no relationship with saprotrophic fungi. So basically, the take home of this slide is that there, there is some evidence both of functional contingency and functional redundancy in the system as uh, fungal communities change, and they might even balance each other out in the end. So recapping these three broad questions, I looked at how different soil fungal groups responded to warming and disturbance. I find both evidence of community shifts with ectomycorrhizal and saprotrophic fungi. And importantly, there's this uh, sort of uh, balance between mutualist and decomposer ratios that starts to decline with warming, which could have important implications in the system. I looked at how interconnectivity of microbial communities could predict community change, finding that more connected communities were more resistant to compositional shifts in response to warming and disturbance. And finally, I looked at how structure and function were related, finding some more complicated patterns where both functional contingency and functional redundancy seem to come out of the system as, as these fungal communities change. So the take home here is that fungal community shifts really reflected this shifting balance of fungal mutualists like ectomycorrhizae to the more free living fungal decomposers of saprotrophs. And that these community shifts can actually be predicted by the interconnectivity of taxa in the samples. And that community shifts are also linked to changes in soil enzymatic function, which of course have consequences for the degradation of organic matter and soil carbon cycling in ecosystem function here. So this is where I would like to end, um, and I'm happy to take any of your questions at the end during the Q&A, and I'm ready to relinquish control of my screen, Sarah. Okay, thank you, Michael, very much. And again, uh, you can send in your uh, questions and we'll get to them then at the uh, end of the session. So it's my pleasure to then move us to New Zealand from North America and our next speaker is Amanda Black from uh, uh, the uh, Bioprotection Research Center at Lincoln University in Lincoln, New Zealand and will be discussing uh, old growth forests and the cowrie with exotic pine plantation forests in New Zealand. Amanda, welcome. Thank you. Good morning from New Zealand. Uh, thank you, Max and um, Afems, for providing this opportunity, albeit early one, to present uh, one of our studies as part of our broader program. And um, sorry, I'll just see my screen so I know what I'm actually talking about. And uh, trying to look at um, basically the landscape ecology and some of our indigenous forest ecosystems. So this, this study, which is the paper which this is based on, is um, actually one of my PhD students in our, in our lab group, and um, apologies for that. And um, as I described, it's like uh, a much, much broader program, and this particular one was looking at the soil microbial diversity in these ancient forest systems with the adjacent uh, land use changes. Her name's Alexa. So I guess that it, you know, in New Zealand, we have Cody Dobek, which I'll introduce much later. Uh, and it's one of these uh, significant um, issues that we have, where we have 100% of the trees that are infected have um, dieback, and there's no cure right now. And, you know, this is part of this whole global issue of forest disease and dieback occurring at sort of unprecedented global scales. And this is exacerbated through clearance and we have fragmentation and of course biological invasions with um, the nursery trade and just global movement and of course climate change makes things a little bit worse. And this is this is quite, uh, I think, scary for us as um, 
I guess, on life on Earth because forests are essential for our survival. Um, they hold much of the biodiversity, of course, carbon storage, and this helps regulate climate change. And here's just some of the examples, not only in New Zealand do we have Cody Dieback, but across, across the ditch in Australia, we have Jarrah Dieback, in Hawaii, we have Rapid Ohia Death and Ash Dieback, all sort of have the underlying issue of an introduced plant pathogen causing this. The tree species that I'm going to talk about is, is one that's, uh, I guess, pretty much around the Pacific. It's um, actually only around the Pacific, so it's a belongs to an ancient long-lived family of conifers. It's Agathis, and the endemic species in New Zealand is Agathis australis. There are 21 species around the South Pacific, and actually uh, quite a number of them are under attack by a Phytophthora pathogen, which is the organism that I'm going to talk about this morning or this afternoon, wherever you may be. So the Cody forest that I'm talking about is one of our keystone forests in, in the top of New Zealand and it naturally occurs at 37 um, latitude south. It's uh, at the moment, it used to cover about a million hectares and it's reduced to less than 0.4% uh, of the original forest. It's uh, found now in highly modified small remnant stands and of these, a lot of them are regenerating, but only there's only less than 1% uh, of the original growth remains of these ancient systems. And when I say ancient systems, these trees are very, very long lived. They live to up to 2000 years old. And so they are, I guess, we, what we consider keystone forest ecosystem drivers. So much of the associated plants and the invertebrates and the animals around them are kind of co-evolved and very much dependent on these trees existing. And they also have a unique soil ecosystem as well. These are just some of the plant species that are associated with Cody. Uh, there's about 21 species completely dependent on the existence of these trees. These trees are now, because they're introduced uh, phytophthora pathogen, they're now listed as threatened. And so if these go and we have no cure, then much of the ecosystem in the northern part of New Zealand will change drastically as many of these coal species will become extinct as well. So as I mentioned before, this is part of a much, much bigger program. And when this when we identified what was actually happening, there was many, many questions that were unanswered. And while a lot of the focus tends to be on the host pathogen interaction, nobody actually understood what was happening in the landscape in terms of the ecology and how uh, these invasive pathogens were changing, I guess, our soil microbial ecosystems including that was the land use changes, how that may actually um, vector, what we call rural vectoring from one fragment to another. And these land use changes in between with where we have you know, commercial forestry now set up um, and pasture for um, animal production and how these actually may, uh, I guess, increase the uh, virulence of and, and the spread of these diseases. And so some of the questions that we're looking at is how have, these successive ecological disturbances impacted on the soil microbial community in these ancient forests and their functional responses. I mean, I guess I should talk about what's happened in the New Zealand ecosystem and that it's uh, compared to the rest of the world, it's very, very um, late settled in terms of human settlements. And so I guess in the early 1800s, we have New Zealand was it's an ark and it has birds, like it had many, many birds. We don't have a lot of land mammals. And so these birds predominantly provide a lot of the nutrient input into our soils. And they disappeared as people came. In the 1800s to uh, early last century, we had significant land clearance for um, logging, but also to um, provide that sort of commercial pasture and um, pine forestry, which underpins a lot of our economy here. And then with the nursery trade and establishment of forestry from importing seed and plant material from around the world, we had an explosion of um, introduced plant pathogens. And the one that's affecting Cody today is, is a Phytophthora, uh, named Phytophthora the agatha dissida in 2015. Um, unknown its origin, we suspect somewhere from around the Pacific, but um, the devastation it's causing is um, something of concern. And so once we have these as part of this, how do we, like, how, how is all this impacting on, I guess, the function and the community structure of the soil microorganisms, including its ability to store carbon as well. So just a brief history of the emergence of Codidiopic in New Zealand. It's, um, it's a novel pathogen and it's associated with the tree death that was identified as Phytophthora agathodicida. 
in 2015, that was actually misidentified uh, 10 years beforehand. And what it is, it's a soil pathogen, uh, so it infects Cody via the root systems, and it has six life cycle stages, which means it's incredibly difficult to actually manage. And at this time, we do have um, boardwalks and wash stations in place to try and manage that with disinfectant. It's a virulent invasive pathogen. There is no life stage of a tree that uh, seems to be immune to it. Whether the seedlings get infected, the rickers, which we call the young trees, which are around 150 years old, and the iconic long-lived trees are about 2,000 years, they all succumb to the disease eventually. Some of the vector controls we have around uh, our forest is these uh, boardwalks and wash stations, which have a, a trigene a disinfectant in it. And when we go around the communities and we discuss you know, the possible vectoring and where you can help to prevent the spread of this, we typically show these uh, diagrams here. It's like on your vehicles, your shoes, they can transmit these uh, now the ooze spores usually are the survival spores. Once they settle in the ground and the conditions are right, they tend to germinate. Sporangia release ooze spores, which go on and infect the host. And we have found that this particular pathogen is not fussy, but however, it has a devastating impact on the Cody forest and the trees. The study site of interest that we have focused on is Waipua. Waipua is the, our largest, uh, I guess, remnant growth ancient forest system that we have and it's home to some of our iconic big trees that are around about 2,000 years old and these are big big trees they they store up to 30 cubic um, tons of carbon they typically stand they have a girth of 15 meters and they stand more than 30 meters high so they are significant trees and they uh, exist now within these fragmented forest um, land use changes I'll do is I'll just change my pointer so a laser pointer here. And these forest systems here are, are tiny. This is a regenerating forest system here. And this is a typical, uh, I guess, New Zealand landscape in this area. And it's very much pasture. And we have commercial forestry at the site here. So all these little patches of our remnant old growth forest are up to 2000 years old here, uh, surrounded by all these land use changes. And what the study part of the study was was to try and um, understand how these land use changes here with the sampling sites are impacting on the virulence and the spread of this of this pathogen. And I should say that um, this study was done and it's one of uh, I guess it's a, a new kind of study that was done in um, collaboration with the traditional landowners. So in New Zealand we have a lot of uh, forestry owned by the indigenous community and traditional landowners and this was done in partnership with them. The initial study which I guess pre um, preempted the, the work in this paper was looking at the land use effects and it was a very simple study published in forest pathology where we took soils from around um, the, the pasture sites, the commercial forestry and the old growth remnant stands. And what we did is we grew up um, the Phytophthora agathodista in mirror cloths and we exposed them to the different uh, soil uses that we got around the country, around from the area here. And what we saw is that we got a difference in a mature sporangia count and also in um, mature ooze spore count. And, and what that said to us, there's certainly something happening in the, uh, I guess, either physic, uh, chemically, physically nutrient or uh, bio biologically, that is encouraging the growth of mature sporangia and ooze spores, part of the life cycle stage of uh, Phytophthora, and that certainly increases its ability to uh, grow in these different land use changes. And it, it hinted that there was a potential for, for many of these land use different land uses around these old growth remnant forests to provide a, perhaps a disease reservoir and for that we weren't sure. So we did further sampling analysis and we looked at more at the, the microbial community and composition around these land use changes and we compared the true, I guess the two tree dominated uh, land uses which is our old growth Cody forest systems and our commercial pine plantation. Now our commercial pine is Pinus radiata and it has a rotational life of 25 years. And um, so what we did is we increased the sampling sites 
and, and we only took from the organic layer, uh, sampled at 10 centimetres depth. So we have one of the field technicians out here sampling. And we, we typically take a grid. And um, the thing about Cody Forest is it's very, very dominated leaf litter and under there it's um, much, much mineral horizon. This photo here is a typical, it's a rare soil type, it's a podzole and these form under these big trees and it, even if you do change the land use, what you tend to get underneath here is the podzoles that have formed. And that's because these trees form massive, massive uh, leaf litter layers, some of them have up to two metres in depth as literally their leaves just fall down and they create this leaching effect with tannins that go through and they do change the nutrient status around them and making it very hard for certain other kinds of plants to live there but also creates this very unusual soil microbial community. And we uh, analysed at these different sites where the soil chemistry was assessed so our usual biological available air and nitrogen, uh, organic matter, carbon, phosphorus, uh, pH. And we uh, also extracted DNA using usual DNA uh, easy kits, alumina sequencing of the gene region and bioinformatics using chyme. And we compared the differences in alpha and uh, diversity and composition. And we sort of correlated these differences back to soil chemical properties to see if we could get a relationship between the difference of community structure and composition and um, chemical properties. Oops, so I've lost my screen. Sorry. So these ordination plots, we have the fungal communities here on, um, I guess my left hand side, and the bacterial communities here on the right hand side, and the green dots represent uh, the soil under the, the pine forest, and the red triangles represent the soil under the coyote forest. And what we found is that there was a very distinct difference between fungal communities under these tree species. Um, the diversity, uh, the soil under the pine plantation had higher species diversities than the native Cody soils, with the Cody soils having a sort of a fewer fungal taxa with, but with higher abundance. There was a significant difference in the composition of fungal communities between Cody and pine, and that's quite uh, obvious in these ordination plots here. There was also, we found the same in the bacteria species, but we, what we also found, what we didn't find in the fungal communities is that the heterogeneity of the sites also contributed to this difference. So making the bacterial community's difference is not so pronounced under land use and, and a little harder to interpret the results there. What we did find in the, um, I guess the soil physiochemical properties is that um, we do have a difference in the uh, carbon and nitrogen ratios. And the Mantel test revealed that that was one of the, um, explanatory variables with that and uh, organic matter correlated to the differences in the fungal communities. But for the bacterial communities, it was more around about um, a biologically available nitrogen and total carbon in the composition. Right. So we, on the, um, on this side here, we have the relative frequency of the fungal taxa that we saw. Uh, and it's a little bit small, but um, basically on this side, we have the soil taken under the Cody forest. And on this side, we have the soil taken under the pine forest. And there were a total of 18 fungal phyla in um, these soils with probably about 5% that were unassigned. Uh, Escomycota and Basidia mycota form the majority of the reeds. Escomycota was certainly higher in the pine here, where Bascomycota was certainly higher in the Cody soils. And if we go over to the heat, um, differential heat tree reeds that we see in the blue nodes here represented the high counts in the pine forest and in, in these um, orders. Sorry, half my screen is covered by the um, <laughs> the menu for the for the webinar itself and, and the green and the green uh, nodes here were certainly they um, dominated by um, the Cody forests and so what we did see is that um, the major fungal taxonomic groups 
with significantly differences in their relative abundance again. So the green ones up here were the Cody forest and they're here with the blue ones. And, and what this is, it's kind of a reconnaissance sampling, but it, what it's, uh, I guess, further demonstrating in these diagrams is that there were quite distinct and significant differences between the fungal communities and the land uses in pine soil versus um, the Cody soils. Again, in the bacterial communities, we'll be looking at the, um, the frequency, relative frequency diagram here, we have Cody on the side, on this side here, and we have pine on this side. And uh, in the bacteria, we had 51 species, uh, uh, phyla recovered. Uh, I guess the majority of these were significantly low. So while we had quite a lot of phyla, we didn't have, uh, I, I guess, a lot of abundance. And the only the 20 most abundance were actually shown here. And again, the same for the, um, the um, sorry, the uh, tree. We have green shown in here, the nodes for the Cody soils, and we have the blue here. And I have to guess because my screen's half covered. <laughs> um, and over here as well as for the pine soils. And while we do see these differences in the bacteria and between the land uses, that again, this, this relationship is not so strong as we see in the fungal community changes. So I guess the story is a little more complicated and, and more difficult to interpret, and it would require further um, exploration about what this actually means in terms of land use changes, but also with the, uh, I guess, the introduction of these uh, pathogens of Hydrophobia agathodicida. And I just wanted to introduce this, uh, it's another paper, but it's also part of this bigger study, it's around the community metagenomics that we looked at in, in these particular sites. And so we went from comparing pine as a land use and, and Cody as another land use, but we also looked at the, the differences between in these communities where we had, uh, I guess, infected trees versus um, non-infected trees. And what we did find is that the, there was a significant difference in the biochemical, uh, biogeochemical cycling genes, particularly in the carbon degradation genes. So we find that um, in, in infected sites, we had um, complete differences in the carbon degradation genes than we did at the uninfected sites. And the implications here are uh, disturbing. Uh, so I should have said that the, the red here represents the asymptomatic or uninfected sites, and the blue is the symptomatic. Um, which is the trees that have obvious disease symptoms shown. And it has implications for carbon storage and certainly carbon storage within the soil system as well. And this is something that uh, we need to, it's something we haven't actually considered in, in, in the system is like, how do these pathogens, not only land use chases, but how do these pathogens uh, influence uh, carbon cycling in these systems. But some of the take home, um, I guess, discussion points here is that the altered soil micro communities, that the forest type exerts strong influence on the diversity and composition of the soil communities. Um, sorry, I'm just going to, I can't actually read my screen, it's terrible. Uh, exerts a strong influence on the diversity and composition of the soil, and the soil fungal communities of Kaidi were more, certainly more well defined in the community and dominated by a few key groups. And the differences in the soil chemical properties did uh, uh, um, certainly align with the differences in the microbial communities and helped explain some of the differences that we saw in the forest types. And how does this link back to dieback? Well, also interestingly, we didn't find any of the pathogen in the, the pine forest that we sampled. And what we did find when we did have it, there's a table in the paper that looks at the, the different, I guess, the trophic levels uh, of between these two systems. And we did find a lot more saprophytes that existed in the Cody forest, and a, a lot more uh, symbiotrophic fungi happening in the in the pine forest. And the implication here is that with all these land use changes and the introduction of different plant species, that there is a potential that we have lost a lot of our protective fungi to, I guess, 
protect against these invasive pathogens and and how does that I guess relate to inform particular management plan when it comes to you know is there a certain remnant size of these land use changes that we can um, certainly identify is that any smaller than that and they're under um, I guess more threat to these invasive pathogens with the loss of their I guess their protective fungi and and how does this um, these uh, changes interact and we look at restoration of these old when we look at regeneration and restoration of these kauri forests how does that influence their ability to I guess resist these pathogens as well so the future is here is part of the program comes under um, I guess the interest here was we have a billion tree program uh, I think that happens a lot around the world where the uh, we look to plant more and more trees to offset a lot of our carbon things but if we are losing a lot of our protective fungi in the soils then then that has implications there perhaps that we need to look at the type of tree species that we plant we also need to look further and, and see what actual properties and, and microbiota are positively associated with soil health and we also need to identify the other environmental factors that are ability that have the ability to defend against this pathogen um, I'd like to acknowledge that this was funded by a tertiary education commission and in collaboration with Tororo who are the indigenous owners and uh, community that we work with collaboratively um, in collaboration with. Thank you and that was me. Um, I apologise I couldn't see half my screen but hopefully that you've got I guess the key messages there and of course there's the paper that you can look at. Over to you Max, Sarah. Thank you very much, Amanda. And uh, we'll come back to, I think, a number of question points that are also coming up already. And uh, I also have things to ask further, but very interesting. So we will quickly jump to Europe. And our next speaker is Fleming Eckelund from the Department of Biology at the University of Copenhagen. And he will examine a different kind of a disturbance. This is again the response of wood ash application in both agricultural and forest soils. So Fleming, thank you. Yeah, thank you. I'll do this uh, presentation of, of uh, this paper that was uh, previously uh, published in, um, in Femmes Microbiology Ecology, which is called Total INR Sequence. Uh, in a sequencing reveals multi-level microbial community changes and functional responses to wood ash application in agricultural and forest soil. And I, I'd say that it, it's uh, it's part of of uh, of of, uh, of a much larger project that we did in uh, our center for bioenergy uh, bio recycling ash bag. Um, and then uh, I think if, if you see the title, you may want to ask two questions. Uh, and the first question would be, why should we investigate uh, wood ash? Uh, and that is, in, in, at least in, in our part of the world, it is a, a very relevant thing because a lot of our energy, it, it, uh, it comes from from wood. This is di disputed at the moment. Uh, many people think that it's actually not a very green energy, but still this is a fact that much of our energy comes from from uh, from, from wood. And there, there are several uh, issues associated with this uh, wood ash. Uh, one thing is that uh, deposition of wood ash merely as a waste is it's costly. And it's also uh, a problem that, that uh, there are uh, lots of uh, essential plant nutrients in wood ash which are just lost if the ash is just deposited. Uh, so it may be a good idea to recycle the wood ash to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to reuse the, the, the plant nutrients. It's also an issue, however, that, that uh, the wood ash may contain uh, heavy metals and that it has a drastic effect on soil pH. But what we did in this, uh, uh, in this ash bag center was that we uh, investigated uh, 
possible the negative side effects of wood ash recycling in various ways. And this is one of the of, of the papers that came out of it. And then <clears throat> question number two would be why should we apply this uh, total RNA, RNA sequencing uh, instead of more conventional methods? And it, is, it is because it will allow to simultaneously assess uh, all parts, more or less at least, of the soil microbial community, prokaryotes, fungi, micro eukaryotes that I have worked a lot with myself and which are often overlooked in, 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 in microbial ecology. Also, it, it will uh, allow uh, to, at the same time, to detect uh, expression of functional genes if, we, if uh, we more or less get the full RNA picture out of the soil. And it has the advantage also as compared to more conventional DNA-based methods that we have no primer bias as we have in the DNA-based uh, methods. <clears throat> and this is what we did. As it also uh, says in the title, we, uh, we, we uh, looked at uh, two different soils. Uh, a loamy sandy agricultural soil and a humic uh, forest soil, the O-horizon. And from these two soils, we made uh, microcosms in uh, triplicates uh, from 50 grams of soil. Uh, and we mi mixed this uh, soil with wood ash to different uh, concentrations. That is 0, 3, 12 and 90 tons ash per hectare corresponding to these uh, to these amendments. And uh, it is essential to say here that the normal uh, amendment to, to, to a normal soil, if you applied in a forest, would be three tons. So, so we used uh, also some quite unrealistic uh, doses, which I think is necessary if you want to do an experiment like this, because Otherwise, you may not see the effects that are there when you apply small doses, but may not be very clear when you only apply the small doses. And then uh, in these uh, systems, we destructively sampled on day 3, 10, 30 and 100. And we measured then uh, four different types of parameters, we measured uh, physical chemical soil parameters, uh, uh, I'd say pH should be mentioned first, the pH, uh, electrical conductivity, uh, where we measured uh, uh, organic uh, carbon uh, uh, and uh, we measured uh, nitrate, uh, ammonium and phosphate. Then we did a, a more conventional quantitative PCR to uh, estimate uh, abundance of uh, bacteria and fungi. And then we measured these pools of uh, RNA, ribosomal RNA, that is to, to, uh, to uh, investigate diversity and richness. And we uh, measured uh, messenger RNA to get some idea about uh, different functional genes expressed in the systems that we work with. And these are, I'd say, some of the results uh, that I present here. Uh, and the first one is the physical chemical soil parameters. We saw, not very surprising, uh, we saw an uh, large increase in pH in the soils and it is uh, because it it, uh, it influences the results that I'll show larger you should notice that this uh, the, the y the scales on the y-axis here are not the same the upper graphs here show the, the pH that that uh, that we reached a much higher final pH in the agricultural soil than we did in the forest soil. Uh, 
also we had an increase in conductivity because of all the different ions that, that, that we uh, that we amended the soil with also uh, we got an uh, increase in uh, the soft soft uh, carbon also which is uh, probably primarily uh, because of, of of simple physical chemical interactions uh, with the soil that the ash facilitated we then we got an increase in ammonium which is which is probably uh, due to various uh, various microbial interactions uh, this uh, ammonium increase is not as clear as the increase in some of the other parameters because the microbial interactions are complex and similarly we can see uh, we can see that there is a, uh, an effect on, on nitrate which is uh, even more uh, more mixed than the uh, effect that we see on ammonium and then also we see an effect on on uh, on, uh, on phosphate uh, which is also not straightforward probably because that the diff the, the, the effects on, on pH will affect the solubility of the phosphate. We, uh, we, uh, I haven't shown that, but we, we analyzed the results and uh, this analysis showed that, uh, that, the, uh, that pH conductivity uh, uh, dissolved carbon and phosphate were the main drivers of the microbial changes that we saw in the systems and that I'll show now. The first one is the qPCR and we can we can see here uh, a picture which is uh, which is similar in all the microbial uh, all the microbial uh, uh, measurements that we made that uh, that we have I'd say a more or less straight not completely straight straightforward but more or less straightforward uh, effect on uh, micro positive i'd say um, effect on microorganisms uh, uh, in in the forest soil because there we we reached after the ash application we reached some ph levels that are uh, favorable for uh, for the microorganisms that that we that we looked at um, and also here you should notice that that this the scales are quite different on on, on the graphs but on the upper graphs here we we have uh, uh, bacteria as measured by 16 uh, s RNA genes and below we have fungi as measured by ITS um, and you you can see that in the forest soil where we reached as I would say the uh, favor, favorable uh, pH values we have a, a, a clear effect but but uh, no really clear effect in the agricultural soil uh, except that we see that uh, the bacteria uh, they they were actually diminished by this treatment it should be noticed though here that this is uh, qPCR and we are we do have here this primer bias. Uh, then uh, we we look here at uh, the results from directly measured uh, by the, the ribos ribosomal RNA uh, where we have no uh, primer biases and uh, what what we see here are relative frequencies of the different uh, types of uh, microorganisms we <clears throat> firstly you may notice uh, that uh, in, in, in the first, uh, in the upper panel here, uh, we have all groups of organisms. Uh, and this is 0, 3, 12, and 90 tons uh, ash per hectare. And you can see that there's no 90 tons uh, uh, ash per hectare in the agricultural soil because something happened which prevented us from, from look at the RNA 
as, as you saw on the previous graphs, it's not because all uh, the organisms actually were il eliminated by the high pH, but we were not able to retrieve any RNA. Uh, overall, and probably not very surprisingly, if, if you look at this uh, panel, uh, which shows the bacteria, uh, we could see that uh, overall uh, uh, amendment with bioash stimulated the stimulated uh, the uh, stimulated the copiotrophic bacteria, whereas there was a, a the opposite tendency for, for the oligotrophic bacteria uh, that they declined, at least with high ash amendments. Uh, and um, you can also see that uh, in, maybe a bit surprisingly, that in the 90 tons per hectare treatment uh, uh, in the forest soil, uh, we saw uh, a uh, an increase in number of fungi. But it is worth mentioning here that it's it's only a particular group of fungi that actually carries most of this uh, increase. And then I have here on the next slide, I have taken from the previous slide the, the, the two lower ones, the two lower uh, panels from the previous slides, to, to show in, in, uh, in more detail that we saw for all systems, uh, just we, we, we saw an increase in, in the number of uh, micro eukaryotes, meaning mostly protozoa, with time here in the agricultural soil and the three uh, ash amendments and here in in the forest soil, and this general uh, increase, I would I would tend to think that this has not so much to do with the experimental purpose, but rather that when we we have this, I would call the closed system effect, that we have a certain micro succession when we make a closed system, a closed system. And here we, it's, it's not unusual to see a micro succession here ending up with a lot of graces in, in the end. But in, in, uh, in uh, the forest soil, there, there was also this effect was also overlaid by what we were looking for. That is that we could see that this uh, micro succession was stronger with higher ash amendments. Then the two lower panels here uh, show uh, total for all groups, over all groups of organisms, that is fungi, micro, uh, micrograzes, bacteria, etc. What we looked at uh, show uh, how this, uh, how the treatments and the time affected um, uh, uh, richness and and the upper graphs and uh, diversity. You can see that pretty similar. These not completely, but pretty similar. These patterns we see here, and and uh, you can see at a general decline with time in the systems where in in the agricultural systems. Uh, which is also, I think, uh, uh, a result of this, I would call, closed system effect, that that uh, things happen in a closed system do, that are different from, from a normal system. But, but, uh, <clears throat> but we can see that in the forest soil, a similar thing, we, we did not see quite the same pattern here which is probably because that the organisms that we focused on, they were actually stimulated by the pH change that the ash promoted. Then to the, to the functional genes, uh, we did find, as we expected, an increased transcription of presumed stress response genes uh, 
at, but only at the very highest level of, of ash. And that is that we uh, we find we found uh, genes associated uh, with sporulation, which is bacterial sporulation, which is a thing that takes place under unfavorable conditions. Also, uh, we found we found uh, uh, an increase in uh, in membrane transporter proteins, uh, which we uh, believe. Uh, was a, a result of the changed osmotic conditions uh, and the changed content of, of uh, toxic metals in the system. And uh, finally, we found an increase in chaperones that are genes that ensure correct folding of proteins and are involved in in uh, in uh, in house cells. They cope with uh, stress-induced denaturation of proteins. And then, um, finally, a few conclusions. Uh, we did find, as we hoped to find, that uh, the total uh, RNA sequencing allowed us to, at the same time, follow bacterial fungi uh, and bacterial feeding protozoa in using the same method. Um, and uh, in especially this pattern was not clear in the agricultural soil, but in particular in the forest soil, the high ash doses, which caused, I would say, a, a pH to increase to a moderate but higher level, uh, we found an increased bacterial growth which the protozoa responded to, and this final re finally resulted in a decreasing fraction, the uh, relative fraction of bacteria in, in this system. Um, and also, we found that analysis of messenger RNA demonstrated increased transcription of presumed uh, stress response genes at uh, 90 tons. Uh, Ash per hectare. I, I, I should add, I should have added an, another line, which is that this this method actually provides us with some quite um, astonishing uh, possibilities, which we are more or less not able to use at the moment because really many of of uh, the results that we get, both in terms of of ribosomal and messenger RNA, we're not able to interpret them because we don't know actually what uh, what genes and we don't know what organisms that we actually find represented in the samples. This will hopefully uh, improve in the future. And then finally, <clears throat> I will uh, uh, thank uh, the the Danish Council for Strategic Research for supporting supporting uh, our center, and I will thank the persons already named on on, on the first slide, uh, but also the many other good colleagues that from from Ashback, and I would in particular uh, uh, like to thank my my uh, uh, my former colleague and. Uh, head of our uh, Ashback Center. Yeah, thank you. That was that. Well, thank you very much, Fleming. And indeed, thank you to all our speakers, uh, Michael, Amanda, and Fleming. And so we will open this up for question and discussion. And before that, I also want to thank both Sarah McKenna and Joseph Shuttleworth, who in the background are making sure that everything is working well and all the connections are in place. So thank you. But again, uh, Michael and Amanda, if you'll join us as well, then we'll look into the uh, questions.
So this is one actually for Michael. Do you have plans to test if the enzymatic profiles map to the genomes? And the reason this is Joe Sariva who's asking is because it has been suggested a positive correlation of functional redundancy contingency with microbial diversity. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, at this point, we don't because our um, uh, I came into the project when the data had already been kind of assembled and the enzyme assay was already completed and the amplicon sequencing were already run. So um, I think that there is some uh, transcriptomic and sort of more genomic based functional uh, data that's being that is starting to come out of the B4 warmed project. But um, as far as it relates to my specific role in the project, I don't have any uh, any specific contribution to that to that part. So we were left with the enzyme assay. And but the the person asking the question is completely right that it's it can be very difficult to link the sort of compositional profile of a microbial community from amplicon sequencing to the functional potential with the with an enzyme assay, which of course measures total potential activity and not necessarily um, maybe the most uh, critical or or sort of real aspect of the functional potential of the system. Um, yeah, that's a good question though. And this is actually a follow-up question and also a similar one from Tamar Barquet uh, relating to biomass of fungi to bacteria and also, I mean, could the species interactions between fungal groups and their surrounding bacterial partners be important? Um, yeah, that's very possible. So I imagine um, that the fungal to bacterial biomass ratio probably shifts. We don't, I don't have access to that data. So um, that's not something I can answer specifically, but I think recalling back to other sorts of forest warming experiment papers that I've read, I do remember um, people have noted shifts in fungal to bacteria biomass ratios. So I, would, I guess I would imagine sort of bacterial biomass to increase relative to fungal biomass in this system because past papers have shown declines in, in fungal um, taxa, like specifically ectomycorrhizal taxa. Um, I forget the second part of the of the question, but. Oh, yeah, well, this is the, then the interactions between bacterial fungal communities as well. Yeah, so I, I have looked, to study them. I looked at that briefly when I was, um, I did some sort of kind of basic network analyses to see if there were, um, interesting like interkin interkingdom uh, correlational patterns between bacteria and fungi um, and there did seem to be some different correlational patterns between the warming treatments like different groups of fungi were differently connected to different groups of bacteria but it never couldn't really get a clear sense of what that would mean um, but certainly it, it seems possible that these microbes are interacting and in ways that um, I wasn't able to test with the data that I had, but uh, certainly could be important for determining their compositional shifts or functional responses. Yeah, I have a follow-up question, I mean, both to you, Michael, but also to Amanda on thinking of, one, we're looking at the soil microbial community structures, bacteria, fungi, and so on, but how much of that whether it's the temperature effects or of course then when you have dieback of a key species is really the changing vegetation that might be driving what's happening in, in the soil communities and how do you start linking to that and did you follow that for example michael on i did not there's a, a paper by chris fernandez in global change ecology that did link um changes in ectomycorrhizal uh, community composition and taxonomic responses to changes in tree species performance using photosynthetic rates. So there is some past work in my experiment linking microbial responses to physiological changes. Of so I was kind of building off, off of that work. Um, maybe Amanda, you could talk about how that applies in your, in your system. It's a, you know, it's a really good question, trying to understand what is actually driving what um, you know, when we, when we get pathogen invasions, obviously you, um, these trees become infected, uh, you're going to get a change in, in carbon signatures and, and inputs into the soil, but also <clears throat> you're going to get um, 
a change in leaf litter composition because you know when sick trees are they, they tend to drop different things and so that potentially could be driving the community shifts that we see or it could be the invasion of the pathogen driving the community shifts that we see we haven't been able i mean that's that that would be something we'd like to do but that's you know a study that i think needs to be done but the problem with doing it in the field is like we can't set up field trials with an organism that we illegally can't. <laughs> we have to do it in the lab, and then the trouble with doing it in the lab is that um, because these trees are so long lived, the systems that we replicate and, and mesocosm stuff just don't give us that clear picture. And we've tried it with seedlings, and we just it's just all muddled and murky. But a really good question, and and that's something that we'd like to look at in future. Okay, let me go to ash additions. And so there's two questions related to that. Uh, one of the cumulative effects on continuous additions of ash to these soils, and then also the impact of cadmium of naval bacterial communities. So how is this affecting in terms of, of this was a one-time addition or is it going to be repeated? Uh, what, what, uh, what, what, what people uh, normally suggest is is that you do it on on a, a regular basis. But regular here, I think it means, uh, as far as I remember, it's uh, it's it's three times in seventy five years or something. But uh, the thing is that that uh, that these pH effects. And this is very, this is very complicated actually, because at least if you, as as I showed, it may have some effects, and I think I wouldn't normally recommend people to to do it in an agricultural soil. It has been attempted, but but normally you would do it in a forest soil, and I don't think there's. Um, I don't, I don't think there's any doubt that it will normally stimulate production in the forest. But the thing is, of course, that if forests are very different. But, but if you have a forest that is uh, worthy of protection or something, it may be a very bad thing to 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 increase the pH. Uh, and and uh, and as I said, the pH effect. Will last a very long time. So if you if you repeat the ash amendment, then you may in in the longer term re, uh, increase pH. That is that is one one thing. Uh, yeah, I, 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 I would like to add. I think to this that uh, that when I I, I said seventy five years. Normally, when we talk about forests. The time perspective is really, really long, uh, and and uh, my guess would be that in 75 years we do have quite other ways of uh, providing society with energy than using biofuel. So, so it 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 is a bit uh, it's a bit a strange discussion this one I think. Uh, the 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 other question was about uh, cadmium. And how would 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 that affect uh, how would that affect things? You could say that if you do this in in a proper way, which we often do not do, but if you did it in a proper way, you would actually only recycle ash in areas where you had harvested wood. Then uh, there would be no problem. Because, because you would only bring back what you actually took from the forest in the first place. So, so, so there would be no problem. But the thing is that, at, at least here in Denmark, we are not doing it in a proper way because we import, uh, we import uh, biofuel, which is, in my opinion, that's a political question, not a very good practice. Uh, uh, so, and in that case, you may increase uh, the cadmium amount uh, in the soil. Still, we have investigated that in detail in 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 other uh, subprojects, and actually, it there seems to be 
only a very slight problem because it's it's not bioavailable cadmium that apparently that you return. Okay. okay, yeah, that was far too long, I think. Okay, well, there's a series of other questions, uh, more broader, relating to really how to measure and analyze microbial diversity and functions in, in soils. And this is really for everyone, and it's actually a, it could be a topic of its whole own for for a webinar, but the approaches, I mean, how, what would you do? There's one is, how much is it worth to invest in amplicon sequencing given the amount of information retrieved is limited to ASVs? Should one focus on metagenomics or other omics, even if the cost is higher? So, yeah, maybe a discussion with everyone. How does it fit to your specific questions? But then also broadly, how do you do enzyme assays? How do you link that with who is going up or down in abundance? So maybe Michael, you want to start? Yeah, yeah, I'll kick things off. Um, in my case, I've worked a lot with sort of traditional compositional-based mic microbiome data sets, so ASVs or OTUs or AMP sequencing type stuff. I've been um, thinking about this type of question for, for a while, um, I think what the sort of position I've settled on is that it is best to try and have some sort of a priori idea about um, what sort of function you expect to change in a system or or how it might change across a gradient that you're studying. So so in our case, in this, in this uh, forest ecotone system, uh, we expected fungi to be important because they play an important role um, symbiotically with plants, but also in terms of accessing hard to access carbon um, and nutrients from highly lignified um, uh, plant organic material. So we expected that enzyme profile shifts um, to reflect sort of a change in peroxidase or polyphenol oxidase or other sort of hydrolytic and oxidative enzymes. And we do see that. Um, I wasn't able to get into it into the paper, but um, we do. We do see more of a direct link between fungal changes and the types of enzymes that are important for their their degradative capabilities. So I, my personal approach is to try and make those links ahead of time and expect to see where uh, functional changes might be occurring. But of course, as I'm sure Amanda and Fleming are going to say, there's drawbacks to any approach, right? The enzyme profile gives you a cumulative sense of maybe potential activity, but it's not linked to organisms. And metagenomics and transcriptomics and all that kind of stuff are you get more of the genetic aspect, but it's harder to tease apart how that's actually functioning in the soil environment. Maybe I can pass that to Amanda and you can talk about that. Well, can I no, just be so bold to say that you should actually mean start with a hypothesis? Yeah. <laughs> and and then yeah. go in and, and look at what methods would be appropriate. Yeah, and that's in certain cases that's easier said than done. When if you need to go in and investigate what patterns are there, just to just to get a starting point. But yeah, that that is my traditional approach. Uh, yeah, no, same. Uh, in the case of this this study that we have, this wider program, which is five years, um, we had to do a bit of that, I guess, reconnaissance sampling to. Uh, to try and get a handle of what patterns there may be out there and, uh, and narrow that down. I mean, we, we all know with our, our scientific background and, and I guess our disciplines that we can guess which which functions we'd be looking at in the case of, you know, forest dieback, you know that, that the carbon's going to be affected. And so you can start to narrow down on things like that. You can look at in general community shifts and we find PLFA is quite good. So, you, you know, your general your general stuff, and then and then refine your questions from them. You suspect that the carbon degradation is going to be affected, and we did just a geochip, so a semi-quantitative analysis of the geochip, and then from there you can narrow down and, and try and tease that all together. But um, I, I guess it also depends on how big your budget is. <laughs> that that sounds, seems to define it a lot more. Yeah. Fleming, you anything to add on on the approaches? <clears throat> yes, um, two things actually uh, I'd like to add. But, but, but firstly, I think your question is um, I think your question is difficult to answer because uh, these methods are actually developing so fast that uh, while we talk about it here, 
it, it may show up that, that another method has been developed which is better. It, it, there's a tremendous uh, uh, there's a, a tremendous development here, and also these methods become cheaper and cheaper. So, 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 so that that that's one thing. So it's it's difficult to give, which is I think frustrating and also interesting. But 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 uh, but um, but also, I, I would say that. But 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 I'm actually much of an organism person. Uh, I think that that it's a pity that it's 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 difficult. I think to get funded to 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 make more basic research to do this interpretation. How what do these organisms actually do? Uh, it's much easier to get funded to make a, a broader uh, a, a broader investigation, which sometimes I would say does not lead us much further than ba basic work in many cases be much better. I'll, no, I I'll mean, there's definitely so many organisms that we don't know yet what they do, what their functions are. So even if you have an ASV or a 16 sRNA full sequence, that still doesn't tell us then what are they up to. No. Yeah, yeah we're only as good as the databases that yeah. you can scaffold context onto and all that kind of stuff. So that, that's really important to consider as well. Okay, I think we need to actually wrap up for the day, or for others, it's just the beginning of the day, or for, for Amanda, but so thank you for getting up very early to join us, and uh, Fleming, uh, for staying up uh, later, and uh, this has been really good. We've had uh, a good audience from around the world. I was looking at this uh, as well, in terms of who's uh tuned in so thank you very much this was a wonderful discussion really good presentations and uh, we'll see each other again uh with the next webinar uh probably in early january so for that take care everyone and and again thanks for for joining in and again if you missed earlier uh webinars they are available on both the oup and fems websites as well and uh, more to read about soil ecology as well. So thank you very much and take care.